I think all of us here are aware of those, even among our own countrymen, who have dedicated themselves to the disgusting task of minimizing or even denying the truth of the Holocaust. This act of intellectual genocide must not go unchallenged, and those who advance these views must be held up to the scorn and wrath of all good and thinking people in this nation and across the world. And yet, just as we must challenge it here at home, so too we must challenge anti-Semitism abroad. And everybody's believed it for the last 50 years, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, nay, millions of schoolchildren have been bussed across Europe to that site and told to go in that building and shudder, because that's where millions of Jews were killed by the Nazis during World War II. And only now is the truth beginning to come out that nobody was gassed in that building because that building was built by the Poles, as they now admit, in 1948, three years after World War II was over. Who could believe it didn't happen? Think about it. For deniers to be right, who would have to be wrong? The victims, the survivors, the bystanders the people who lived in the myriads of towns and villages and cities on the Eastern Front. But above all, who would have to be wrong? The perpetrators, the people who say, we did it, I did it. Think about it. In not one war crimes trial since the end of World War II has a perpetrator of any nationality ever said it didn't happen. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum defines Holocaust denial as an attempt to negate the established facts of the Nazi genocide of European Jewry. The established facts about the Holocaust include, but are not limited to, the death count of approximately 6 million Jews, the use of gas chambers, and the fact that it was a systematic effort by Hitler and the National Socialist German Workers' Party to exterminate the Jewish peoples from Europe and beyond. There are factors about the Holocaust that are debated by academics, such as the functionalism versus intentionalism debate. Whether or not it happened, however, is not up for debate. Holocaust denial? The Holocaust which has the dubious distinction of being the best documented genocide in the world. So the motivation behind Holocaust denial is obviously anti-Semitism. However, leaving the investigation there is not only boring, but also not helpful. Holocaust denial has survived to the present day the same way living things do, evolution. Organisms evolve different biological traits that help them survive, while Holocaust denial survives by incorporating different academic and political causes into its movement. They, as it says in the title, appropriate legitimacy. That is the history of Holocaust denial. It steals ideas from others and then tries to make itself look more mainstream than it really is. And that's what I want to show you in this video. However, before we can talk about Holocaust denial itself, we need to look at the primordial soup from which it emerged. The First World War was ignited in 1914 by the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. Unfortunately for him and the world, the assassin's target was standing on top of the powder kegs of imperialism, nationalism, entangling alliances, and economic interests. One bullet sent Europe into four years of bloodshed, but in order to keep this bloodshed going, the governments needed more than just financial solvency. They needed morale, and this is where war propaganda comes into play. There is a long history of dehumanizing the enemy in times of war. It's not a pretty part of human history, but it's a consistent one. The German occupation of Belgium resulted in some of the most dehumanizing propaganda from the Allied powers. 
German soldiers were accused of raping Belgian nuns and taking infant children from their mother's arms and using them for bayonet practice. A story about German soldiers crucifying a Canadian soldier on the Western Front became a frequent rallying cry. It was so effective that this was brought up again during the Second World War, despite the story never being verified. There were also rumors of Germany taking the bodies of their dead soldiers and melting them down for their fat to make up for the shortage due to the blockade put in place by the Allies. Just like the story about the crucified Canadian soldier, there is no proof of this ever happening. But when it comes to Holocaust denial, the most unfortunate piece of propaganda produced during the war were accusations of the Germans using poison gas on civilians. Now, civilians were harmed by the use of poison gas in the war, but this was never intentional by either side. Wind could spread poison gas from the battlefield into nearby towns and villages. The indiscriminate nature of gas weapons is why the international community, including Germany, agreed to their banning. After the war, scholars would get access to many of the documents from the war, which revealed that most of the propaganda was either outright lies or blown out of proportion. This record of the Allied governments lying about what the Germans did in World War I would become a foundational element of World War I revisionism. After the guns fell silent, the powers of Europe met in Paris to negotiate a formal end to the Great War. In the resulting Treaty of Versailles, the Allies held Germany solely responsible for the war and placed heavy punitive measures intended to make sure Germany was incapable of rising up and challenging the Western Allies. Historians who oppose this provision of the treaty would self-identify as revisionists, in opposition to the government position. Prominent mainstream historians, such as Sidney Brashaw Fay and Charles Beard took positions that held both sides equally responsible for the war, but some revisionists went a step further and placed a majority of the blame on the Allies. One such historian, Harry Elmer Barnes, would become a frequently cited source of Holocaust deniers. Barnes was initially a supporter of the war, but as the lies behind the propaganda came out, he turned against the Wilson administration and went so far as to accuse them of deliberately lying to get the U.S. into the war. His early revisionist writings were popular with socialists, who had opposed the conflict as a clash of capitalists using the working class as pawns for their own financial gain. He was also very popular in Germany, whom he portrayed as being the true victim of the war. Barnes even got to meet Kaiser Wilhelm II in exile during one of his trips to Europe. The former emperor is reported to have blamed the war on an international cabal of Jews and Freemasons. This position was too extreme for Barnes at the time, who continued to blame the war on Britain, Russia, and France. Barnes was considered to be among the most extreme of the revisionists, and yet despite this, he still had a lot of supporters on both the left and the right. This extremism led him to accusing other historians of altering their perceptions of the war based on what would gain them financial or academic success. Over time, his attacks became more and more ad hominem, to the point where even his most diehard supporters had to back off because he was becoming a bit of a toxic liability. And so, by the end of the 1920s, Barnes was no longer teaching at universities, and spent the rest of his academic or scholarly career as an independent researcher and writer. Right as Barnes was ending his academic career, the global economy went south and plunged the world into a depression. This dramatic shock allowed the National Socialists to win ground in Germany until they finally won enough support in the Reichstag to get President Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as Chancellor. From that point until the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the National Socialist regime put more and more pressure on the Jewish population within their borders, and once the war began, they were able to persecute Jews outside of their borders. During this time, World War I revisionists continued to operate as they always had. Many, Barnes prominently among them, referred to any negative press about Adolf Hitler as anti-German propaganda. And these scholars were often tied to the anti-war movement in the US. But it wasn't all Nazi sympathizers. Some were ethnic Germans who simply opposed any military intervention against their homeland, regardless of who was in power. Some were isolationists who believed that America should follow the foreign policy of Thomas Jefferson and avoid entangling alliances. A fair number were anti-communists who feared aiding the expansion of the Soviet Union, and many were leftover skeptics from the first war who were apprehensive about another foreign war driven by lie-laden propaganda and saw the second war as a continuation of the first. Despite all these concerns, the US would still get involved after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. As the war continued and the Germans began to lose ground to the Soviets in Eastern Europe, Hitler and the SS were concerned about the Allies discovering the full extent to the final solution. So they began to liquidate the camps and any evidence by destroying buildings, burning documents, and digging up mass graves. In some cases, they force marched concentration camp internees westward towards Germany so they could continue to be used as slave labor. As the concentration camps were liberated, the world discovered the staggering scale of the extermination program. But people back stateside were somewhat skeptical. I mean, civilians being rounded up and killed by poison gas sounded a lot like the propaganda from the last war. 
But as visual and documentary evidence was made available to the public, most people accepted the fact that Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists orchestrated the genocide of European Jewry. There were two responses to these facts. Just like the previous war, there was a revisionist movement for the Second World War as well, but this one was not nearly as robust. Some of the same names from the previous war came up again. Charles Beard came out with one of the first works criticizing Roosevelt's foreign policy in 1946, and was followed up in 1948 with his final book, President Roosevelt and the Coming of the War 1941, which criticized FDR's policies, claiming that they forced Japan to declare war. The 1948 Foreign Affairs review of the books had this to say, The inevitable result is distortion of fact and improper appraisal of motive. It is safe to say that Mr. Beard's thesis will not stand the test of time. Although it's not exactly mainstream, it is far from dead, and considered gospel amongst certain groups of scholars and activists. Barnes was one of those historians who saw the Second World War as little more than a continuation of the first. Yet, in comparing the two, he said, One of the more notable contrasts in the intellectual atmosphere of today, as compared with that which followed the First World War, is the far greater opposition to the dissemination of truth with respect to the causes of the Second World War. The extent to which the determination to shut off the truth in this field has gone is revealed by the annual report of the Rockefeller Foundation for 1946, where it is frankly stated that a large sum of money has been granted to frustrate and check the rise of revisionism after World War II. There is to be a lavishly subsidized official history directed by men who played an important role in the propaganda and intelligence work. Barnes wrote that in 1950, and despite him not having expressed any actual denial himself yet, he would spend the rest of his career inching ever closer toward it. Where would you expect Holocaust denial to emerge first? Germany? United States? Soviet Union? France? The correct answer is... France! Just like the Christ myth hypothesis, Holocaust denial emerges in France. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. The first work to deny the historicity of the Holocaust was published in 1948 by Maurice Bardichet in his book, Nuremberg or the Promised Land. Bardichet was a literary critic who traveled in numerous nationalist and fascist circles, all the while teaching at Sorbonne University in Paris. After the war, he was briefly arrested for collaboration with the Nazis, and although he was released shortly after, his brother-in-law would be executed for his pro-German writings during the war. Bardichet would be barred from teaching in France's national education system due to his pro-fascist sentiments. So by the time he published Nuremberg or the Promised Land, he was pretty livid. The book was the first to express doubt about the Holocaust, but it wasn't solely about the Holocaust, but rather an attack on the whole of the trials. A portion of the book focused on calling the film and picture evidence of the Holocaust fabrications. But this would not be the end of his work on the French far right. In 1951, he became a co-founder of the European Social Movement, which sought to create a neo-fascist pan-European nationalism. Following up shortly behind Bardichet was Paul Racinier, who published Crossing the Line, The Human Truth in 1949. Strap yourselves in, because Racinier's story is a wild ride. His father had served in the French colonial army in Vietnam. These experiences turned his father into a pacifist, which became a problem during World War I when he was drafted and then put into a military prison. His family all joined the Communist Party after the war, and in 1927, Paul was drafted into the French army serving in Morocco, where the pacifist views he inherited from his father were hardened. He would be expelled from the Communist Party due to his support of incorporating middle-class parties into a political coalition, at which point he joined the Socialist Party while working as a history teacher. He initially condemned Mussolini and Hitler, but after the Munich Agreement, he supported any measure that he thought would preserve peace. He was briefly arrested in 1939 under suspicion that the newspaper he was running was receiving funding from the German government. He was released shortly after, and when France was invaded in 1940, he reported to his militia unit, and after the country was overrun, he joined the French resistance. His actions in the resistance led him to getting arrested and spending time in concentration camps at Buchenwald and Dara. While a prisoner, he worked as part of the inmate government of the camp, and it was his experience in the camp that probably informed his beliefs about the Holocaust. In Crossing the Line, Rassenier claimed that the concentration camps were made to protect the Jews from the rest of the peoples of Germany, while simultaneously preventing them from sabotaging the German war effort. 
he claimed that the bad conditions in the camp were the fault of the inmates themselves. This belief was probably based on his own experiences in Buchenwald and Dara, where communist inmate leaders behaved cruelly towards their inmates with the support of lower ranking SS guards. Rossinier was also the first to argue that there were no gas chambers in the camps. This probably also came from his assumption that all the camps were run the same way as Buchenwald and Dara. He would blame the atrocities committed against the Jews on individuals rather than a systematic order from Hitler and the higher ups in Berlin. The book was published by La Villa Taupe, a far left Marxist publishing house in France. There have been multiple publishing houses in France by that name. However, they have all self identified as being far left and Marxist. Now, if you're a far left it's yourself, you're probably thinking, how could any left wing organization, let alone a far left one, be Holocaust deniers? Well, let me tell you. The founders of La Villa Taupe were communists who broke with Moscow after the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact which made them anti-Stalinist communists. This resulted in the communists still aligned with Moscow to call them right wing. Despite these accusations, they continued to publish anti-capitalist and anti-Stalinist writings. Then in walks Rossinier, a socialist with a book that makes Stalin look bad, which they take up with Augusto. In their eyes, Stalin and the Soviet Union weren't real communists, and the Holocaust was a myth created by the Allies to distract the world from the true evils of capitalism. Some of these communists would go so far as to say that the hypothetical atrocities of the Holocaust are less evil than the real crimes of capitalists. Now, if there are any far leftists still watching and thinking, well, La Villa Talpa don't sound like real communists to me, I'd like to introduce you to the No True Scotsman fallacy. Alternatively, you could just leave it at French communists being French and leave it at that. Anyways, La Villa Talpa would publish Rossinger's next book in 1950, The Lie of Ulysses, which is a book attacking the first-hand account of the Holocaust from its survivors. So the first documented Holocaust deniers came out of France, but there may have been earlier deniers in Germany. One of the reasons this is hard to confirm is the denazification policies of Germany and Austria after the war. They attempted to destroy any artifact left over from the Nazi regime and prevent the production of any new paraphernalia within their borders. They missed a few pieces taken home by foreign soldiers as war booty or souvenirs, like this letter opener my grandfather brought home from his service in the occupation. Due to these policies, anything sympathetic to the old regime had to be suppressed, and therefore it would have to be published and distributed more clandestinely. Two members of the former Reich Ministry for the History of the New Germany, Dr. Heinrich Maltz and Dr. Karl Heinrich Peters, wrote a pamphlet called The Big Swindle of the Six Million. Since it was never legally published, it's hard to tell exactly when it was written. However, we know that it was distributed amongst some National Socialist groups in post-war Germany. The two would write another pamphlet called The Jewish War Against the German People that would be published outside of Germany. However, these are really hard documents to find. I mean, I looked everywhere and couldn't actually find them. They're mostly referenced in one of my sources, which you can find down in the description below. My guess is that these pamphlets only exist in hard copy form at some university in Germany. The earliest known German Holocaust denier was General Otto Ernst Remmer, whose publication, The Remmer Dispatch, promoted Holocaust denial. Remmer is one of the founders of the neo-Nazi movement, and was held in great esteem by them. Along with Holocaust denial, he was a founder of the Socialist Reich Party in 1950, which was part of the European social movement co-founded by Maurice Bartoche. Remmer was sent to prison numerous times for his promotion of National Socialism, much of which was funded by the Soviet Union as a means of undermining the West German government in hopes of a communist takeover. However, a Holocaust denial movement cannot succeed without a willing publisher. And in 1953, another former National Socialist, Herbert Grabert, founded Grabert Verlag in Tübingen, Germany. It would have to be careful in how it published any Holocaust denial or neo-fascist work, but it has survived to the present day as one of the biggest publishers of far-right material in Germany. While it was more difficult to start up Holocaust denial movements in Europe due to the proximity of the actual incident, American anti-Semites benefited from geographic distance as well as the First Amendment to the US Constitution. Although Harry Elmer Barnes expressed doubts about the veracity of all the atrocities supposedly committed by Germany during the war, others would beat him to the punch in becoming the first open American Holocaust denier. Early Holocaust denial in the US was usually punctuated by a belief that at least 5 million of the 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust were actually relocated somewhere in the United States. In 1952, someone by the name of W.D. Henderson made a first recorded claim in a hard to find publication called Bible News Flashes that 5 million illegal Jewish aliens were living in New York. 
Another contender, Benjamin H. Friedman, a Jew who converted to Catholicism, wrote in the anti-Semitic publication Common Sense, a similar claim to that of Henderson. But instead of cutting the number off at 5 million, he claimed the entire 6 million were living in the US. At the time, there were people who wanted the US Census to include a questionnaire about religious practices, to which American Jews were opposed to adding. Friedman claimed that the reason Jews were opposed to this question being added to the census was that it would reveal that there were 6 million more Jews than expected living in the US. This insane accusation ignores the fact that anyone involved in a conspiracy this big would probably be under instructions to hide their religious affiliations anyways. Therefore, a question on a census wouldn't really be of much help in uncovering it. During the 1950s, Harry Elmer Barnes would make contact with Holocaust deniers such as Paul Rossinier, David Hawking, and James J. Martin. Barnes would arrange for Rossinier's work to be translated and published in English. David Hagen, an American revisionist historian, would publish a book in German with help from Barnes called The Forced War, which postulated that the Second World War was started by an Anglo-Polish conspiracy to commit aggression against Germany. Hagen would become more active in the Holocaust denial movement a decade later. James J. Martin was a thinker in the anarcho-libertarian movement of the 1950s and 60s. This movement was marked by radical pacifism, even in the face of people like Adolf Hitler. Barnes and Martin would come together through their mutual distaste for war, which was a growing movement in the 1960s due to the fighting in Vietnam. In his final years, Barnes published more and more articles criticizing what he saw as a lack of scrutiny being used on accusations of German war atrocities, all the while paying no attention to Allied wartime atrocities. Barnes would never publish a work fully denying the Holocaust himself, but his working with and giving positive reviews to those of other Holocaust deniers has led most scholars to label him as one. Harry Elmer Barnes would die in 1968, with many of his works, especially his earlier ones, being held as great works of revisionism and anti-militarism. Preceding Barnes into the grave a year before, Paul Rossinier's final works transitioned from being focused on exonerating Hitler to condemning the State of Israel. One of his final works, The Drama of European Jewry, accused the State of Israel and its international Jewish founders of fabricating the Holocaust as a means of establishing a Jewish state in the British Mandate Palestine, and to extort money from Germany. This shift was an important one for the Holocaust denial movement, as it helped it transition from a fringe anti-Semitic movement into the mainstream of leftist political discourse, or at least appropriate a position within it. The earliest years of Holocaust denial were focused on exonerating Hitler and the National Socialists. And although this never quite went away, in the late 60s they began to trade in their swastikas for suits and ties. It's also around this time that neo-fascist groups discovered that defending Hitler in the Final Solution wasn't the best way to make fascism more palatable to the general public. And so instead of justifying the Holocaust, they decided to start denying its existence instead, feeling that the only way to make fascism a viable political ideology in the 20th century was to expunge the biggest stain on its reputation. And helping with these transitions would be a man named Willis Cardo. Cardo was a World War II veteran who served in the Philippines. He described himself as a Jeffersonian populist, but was best known for promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and Holocaust denial. He was influenced by Adolf Hitler's ideology of National Socialism and the philosophy of Francis Parker Yockey, an American proponent of fascism who had contact with the Deutsche American Bund and the Silver Shirts, two National Socialist organizations in the US that existed prior to 1941. Carto was an ardent anti-communist in the 1950s, who was briefly a part of the John Birch Society, but was kicked out for his extreme anti-Semitism. No longer in the JBS, he founded his own organization, Liberty Lobby, in 1958. The organization was anti-Semitic from its very beginning, but it didn't start promoting Holocaust denial until the late 60s. In 1966, Carto gained control of the American Mercury, a formerly conservative magazine that had published articles by people such as William F. Buckley Jr. and Billy Graham. After Cardo took control, the magazine became more openly anti-Semitic and would eventually start publishing Holocaust denial materials. In 1968, Cardo created Youth for George Wallace to support the segregationist third party candidate. After that failed campaign, Cardo transformed the group into the National Youth Alliance, which in part was intended to serve as a right wing counterpart to the Students for a Democratic Society. However, the group would splinter in the early 70s when a former member of George Lincoln Rockwell's National Socialist White People's Party, William Luther Pierce, broke off a sizable chunk of its membership. Several rifts formed within the National Youth Alliance to the point where none of them were viable political organizations. 
1969, Willis Carter would publish a small book called The Myth of the Six Million. Now, the problem with this is that Cardo didn't write the book. In fact, the book was written by David Hagen, an associate of Harry Elmer Barnes back in the 50s. Well, Hagen didn't like the fact that Cardo published this manuscript that he had written without his permission, and so he would take Cardo to court, and the two of them would eventually settle out of court in 1973. And it was in the 1970s that we saw Holocaust denial begin to resurge in Europe. In France, we have Francois Duprat, who co-founded the National Front Party of Jean-Marie Le Pen, and later his daughter Marie Le Pen. Similar to Paul Rossignier, he was a communist in his youth, but he became an ultranationalist while in university as a student of Maurice Bardichet. Although he didn't write anything on the subject himself, Duprat was known as a Holocaust denier, which has led many to suspect that Jean-Marie Le Pen was as well, but finding definitive evidence of this is difficult. The rumor was strong enough that Marie Le Pen kicked her father out of the National Front when she obtained the leadership as a means of improving the party's public image. Duprat was assassinated with a car bomb in 1978. A Jewish extremist group in France took credit for the attack, but no conclusive evidence was ever found. Some have postulated that the attack actually came from a rival far-right group. However, just like with the theory about Jewish attackers, there is no evidence corroborating this. And so to this day, the case is still open in France. Also in France, we see Robert Farasson, a professor of literature at the University of Lyon and another former student of Maurice Bardichet. In 1974, he revealed himself to be a Holocaust denier when he sent a letter to Yad Vashem, the official Holocaust memorial organization in Israel, listing arguments he believed disproved the Holocaust. In 1978, he would publish The Diary of Anne Frank, Is It Authentic?, in which he argued that the Diary of Anne Frank was a fabrication. The Dutch edition of the book would have a more aggressive title, The Diary of Anne Frank, A Forgery. We also see the first openly denialist writings published in Germany, first in 1973 with The Auschwitz Lie by Thies Christofferson, followed up in 1979 with The Auschwitz Myth by Wilhelm Steglisch, and Forged War Crimes Maligned the German Nation by Udo Wallendi. Christofferson was a veteran of the Wehrmacht stationed near Auschwitz, and in his book he claims that the Gauss Chambers couldn't have existed there. Also, if you've ever heard or read any Holocaust denier compare Auschwitz to a luxury resort, he's the guy that started it. Steglisch was a veteran officer in the German army serving in the anti-aircraft division as an orderly conduct officer near Auschwitz. After the war, he went to law school and became a judge in Hamburg. He was forced to retire in 1974 for his membership in the National Democratic Party, a party that advocated National Socialism, as well as for his contributions to neo-Nazi publications. In the Auschwitz myth, he claims to look at the evidence of the Holocaust from the perspective of a judge and give his analysis that it didn't happen. Udo Wallendi was initially drafted during the war as one of the underage members of the Luftwaffe until he turned 18 in 1945, at which point he was made a full member of the Wehrmacht. He had a long career of publishing works that questioned Germany's culpability in the start of World War II, which at different times have been banned or made legal. These books would all be published by Grabert Verlag in Tübingen. In 1977, we see another German publisher of neo-Nazi and Holocaust denial literature appear, but he was operating outside of Germany, Ernst Zundel. Zundel was born shortly before the start of the war, in which his father was captured on the Eastern Front, and by the time he returned home in 1947, he was an alcoholic. Zundel went to school for graphic art, but immigrated to Canada in 1958 in order to avoid getting conscripted into the West German Army. He married a French-Canadian in Toronto, and with her moved to Montreal in 1961, where he fell under the influence of Adrian Arcand, a fascist journalist who had proclaimed himself the Canadian Fuhrer. Before he became known as a Holocaust denier, he worked as a graphic designer, working at several major studios creating graphics for major Canadian magazines, including running a studio of his own. He managed to get away with this for some time by publishing most of his works under a pseudonym, Christoph Friedrich. He was also considered a credible political activist as well as a media personality at the time in Canada. He ran for a leadership position in Canada's Liberal Party and was an activist for protecting immigrant rights in Canada. It was in the late 70s that this outer facade began to peel, as he became the spokesperson for a German immigrant group in Canada that protested against anti-German stereotypes in media. In 1977, Zundel founded his own publishing house, Samastat, which would publish neo-Nazi and Holocaust denial materials that would be illegally imported into West Germany, which would make Zundel a wanted criminal there. Zundel's double life as a neo-Nazi would be exposed by conservative Canadian journalist Mark Bonakowski, 
The negative attention he received would contribute to his divorce in 1977. But back in the United States, Holocaust denial was continuing its movement toward feigned legitimacy. Right around when Willis Cardo was settling his legal case with David Hagen over illegally publishing The Myth of the Six Million, another pamphlet would be published by Austin App a former contributor to Common Sense. App had been a professor of medieval English literature at Scranton and La Salle universities, and in 1973 he published The Six Million Swindle, in which he laid out the eight axioms of Holocaust denial. Emigration, not extermination, was Nazi Germany's plan for dealing with its Jewish problem. No Jews were gassed in any concentration camp, including Auschwitz. Unaccounted for Jews who disappeared during World War II did so in territory under Soviet occupation. The majority of Jews killed by the Nazis were spies, criminals, and other subversives whom the Nazis had every right to kill. If the Holocaust had any truth to it, Israel would open its archives to historians. All evidence of the figure of six million deaths is from misquotes of Nazis and Nazi documents. The burden of proof rests on those claiming the Holocaust happened, not that those questioning its historicity. There are discrepancies in the number of dead between Jewish historians and other scholars. He claimed the fact that Jews survived at all was proof that none were killed in the first place. App also accused the Nixon administration of supporting Israel in the Yom Kippur War because he was being blackmailed by American Jews who threatened to expose the fact that the government was covering up the six million supposed victims of the Holocaust hiding in the U.S. at the time. And like other anti-Semites, he railed against the Jewish-controlled media as the reason for the Holocaust hoax not being uncovered. 1976 would see the first denialist work to receive popular attention in the United States. The Hoax of the 20th Century by Arthur Butts was different from other Holocaust denial literature that came before it. Most denialist material before it was either in the form of pamphlets handed out at neo-Nazi, KKK, and other white supremacist meetings, or were small parts of books that were focused on exonerating Hitler and the Nazis. Butts' book was the first full-sized work to be focused on refuting the historicity of the Holocaust. It was also one of the first books to be formatted like a proper academic work citing sources and having footnotes in a bibliography. This probably came from Arthur Butts' experience in academia. He was a tenured professor at Northwestern University where he taught electrical engineering. Hoax of the 20th Century was also different in that the author actually criticized other Holocaust deniers in his work, which usually isn't done. And on top of that, he tried to lessen the amount of overt anti-Semitism usually found in Holocaust denial writings. He was also willing to admit that at least one million Jews had been killed by the Nazis, but questions the reliability of eyewitness testimony and documents. However, Butts had a tendency of accepting parts of certain documents and sources as being valid, but not accepting other parts of those same documents as being valid. He also accused an international cabal of Jews of fabricating documents and inserting them into the archives of governments around the world. Now, he fails to mention why, then, this secret international cabal of Jews didn't, you know, forge a document of Hitler expressing his explicit will to execute all the Jews in Germany and Europe, but, you know, meh. The worst thing about all of this? He still has his teaching job at Northwestern University. Thanks, tenure. Hoax of the 20th century would be translated into German by Udo Allendi. This was one of the major steps towards deniers appropriating the legitimacy of academia, but it would take more than a man with one properly footnoted book. It would take someone with experience to run a major organization. Willis Cardo and the Liberty Lobby would be very active in the 1970s, starting up the publication Spotlight which, like Cardo's other publications, published anti-Semitic and Holocaust denial works. Cardo would also publish a collection of Paul Rossinier's denialist writings in 1977 under the title of Debunking the Genocide Myth. In 1978, Willis Cardo would co-found the Institute for Historical Review, which would adopt his own publishing house, which was renamed Noontide Press, which would become the most prominent publisher of Holocaust denial literature. The Institute would have its own journal, the Journal of Historical Review, the IHR would appropriate the legitimacy of World War I revisionists by describing itself as a revisionist historical journal. It would become the axle of the modern Holocaust denial movement, with prominent deniers from before and after becoming members. One of the most prominent members would be British Holocaust denier David Irving. Irving was born in Hutton, England in 1938. His mother was a writer and illustrator of children's books, and his father was a career officer in the Royal Navy. 
Irving claims his skeptical attitude towards mainstream understanding of World War II existed as a young child, questioning the portrayal of Hitler by cartoonists of the time. He attended college in London, but was never able to complete his education due to financial constraints. This resulted in him moving to West Germany in 1959, where he was employed as a steel worker. In 1962, he wrote a series of articles that would become the basis for his 1963 book, The Bombing of Dresden, which was inspired by and contributed to the conversation about the Allied carpet bombing of Germany in 1945 and whether it was just. His book became a bestseller, at which point Irving became a professional writer and independent historian. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Irving would publish a number of other works about World War II along with translating a number of other German war memoirs. One interesting incident happened in 1969, when Irving met with Robert Kemper, who was one of the American prosecutors at the Nuremberg Trials. In a conversation between the two, Irving asked if the official records for the trials had been altered. Irving mentioned his plan to travel to the U.S. to listen to the archival recordings from Nuremberg to see if the records were tampered with. When Kempner returned to the U.S., he wrote a letter to the FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, about Irving, warning him about his many anti-American and anti-Semitic statements. In the 70s, Irving worked on a number of biographies of high-profile Nazis, the most prominent of which being Hitler's War in 1977. In the book, he portrayed Hitler as an intelligent and competent statesman, but was forced into war by Winston Churchill. He argued that Hitler was unaware of the Holocaust as it was happening, but he didn't deny that it was happening. In 1978, he published a follow-up to the book, The War Path, which was criticized for some inaccuracies, but nothing that derailed the sales of either book. In 1981, he published two books, one on the conflict between Allied generals on the Western Front, and another on the Hungarian Uprising of 1956, one of his few works not about World War II. In 1956 Revolt in Hungary, he describes the event as primarily an anti-Jewish uprising. In it, he portrays the communist government installed by the Soviets as comprising mostly of Jews. However, the facts don't hold up this portrayal. There were some Jews in the regime, but most of them had renounced Judaism, and some had made many anti-Semitic statements themselves. This wasn't the first sign of anti-Semitism in his writings, but it was more pronounced than it had been before. Irving's last hurrah before he became openly involved in the Holocaust denial movement was around the supposed discovery of a series of diaries kept by Adolf Hitler. In 1983, the German magazine Stern purchased the diaries for 9 million marks and published portions of them. David Irving had purchased 800 pages of documents supposedly relating to Hitler from the same seller a year earlier, but discovered that they were forgeries. When news of the diaries being purchased came to light, Irving led the campaign in disproving them, going as far as to crash a Stern press conference where he condemned the magazine for claiming that they were authentic. Irving had been the first to claim that the diaries were fake, which eventually turned out to be true. However, this didn't happen until Irving backtracked on his own claims a week later. It is suspected that he changed his mind about the diaries because they mentioned nothing of the Holocaust, which would have backed up his claims made in Hitler's war and the war path. He eventually returned to his original position, but only after every other outlet admitted that the diaries were fake. Irving has been described as both the first and the last person to realize the diaries were forgeries. The era of professionalization would bring Holocaust denial to public attention. However, it would also bring on an era of censorship, which allowed the Holocaust deniers to appropriate another title for themselves. Although Holocaust denial became a thing shortly after World War II, there were no laws explicitly against it written until the 1980s, However, there were still people getting in trouble for Holocaust denial before that. In both West Germany and Austria, denazification laws initially kept Holocaust denial out of public spheres, such as the numerous arrests of Otto Ernst Remmer in the 1950s. In most of these circumstances, it was the promotion of National Socialism that got someone arrested rather than Holocaust denial. The earliest cases specifically relating to denying the Holocaust were tried under laws banning hate speech, incitement, or vilification of racial groups or religious groups. Robert Farrison became one of the first high-profile Holocaust deniers to be put on trial specifically for Holocaust denial. Between 1979 and 1983, Farrison was in and out of court numerous times for falsification of history. During one of these trials in 1980, he published a book defending his position titled Testimony in Defense, Against Those Who Accuse Me of Falsifying History, The Question of the Gas Chambers. This book, like his other denial works, were published by La Villa Taupa, 
But the most famous part of this book was the inclusion of an essay written by Noam Chomsky as a preface. Chomsky had been involved in the case earlier when he signed a petition protesting Ferozian's first conviction in 1979. In response to this incident, Chomsky wrote an essay called Some Elementary Comments on the Rights of Freedom of Expression, in which he attacked his critics for not respecting the principles of freedom of speech. Let me add a final remark about Florisone's alleged anti-Semitism. Note first that even if Florisone were to be a rabid anti-Semite and fanatic pro-Nazi, this would have no bearing whatsoever on the legitimacy of the defense of his civil rights. On the contrary, it would make it all the more imperative to defend them since, once again, it has been a truism for years, indeed centuries, that it is precisely in the case of horrendous ideas is that the right of free expression must be most vigorously defended. It is easy enough to defend free expression for those who require no such defense. Chomsky never gave explicit permission to Ferusian to include his essay at the beginning of his book. But then again, Chomsky had granted anyone permission to use that essay in any way they wanted. Well, this incident made Chomsky so unpopular in France that his political writings weren't translated or published in the country until the 2000s. Just as Chomsky's reputation was ruined in France, so was Farasan's. He had been a relatively obscure figure in France before the trial, but afterwards he became a household name. The upside to this was that when he received fines from his trials, he received financial support from many people on both the extreme left and the extreme right in France. On the other hand, he became very unpopular with most of French society, and subsequently became a target for harassment. As he became more socially isolated in France, he began to increase his involvement with the international Holocaust denial movement, making contact with other deniers such as Ernst Zundel in Canada and David Irving in the UK. Across the border in Germany, we see Thies Christofferson, author of The Auschwitz Lie, sent to prison in 1983, although surprisingly not for Holocaust denial, but for his other anti-Semitic writings. After his release from prison, he relocated to Denmark, where he could publish his writings more freely. But back in the U.S., the Institute for Historical Review was having its own legal troubles. At the first IHR conference in 1979, co-founder David William McCaldin, a member of the National Front from Northern Ireland, offered a $50,000 reward to anyone who could prove that there were gas chambers at Auschwitz for the purpose of killing humans. The reward was a publicity stunt in order to get the IHR more attention. Well, it worked, just not in the way they were hoping. The IHR sent out letters with the challenge to publicly known Holocaust survivors in Southern California. One took the bait, a Hungarian Jew named Mel Mermelstein. In 1981, he took the challenge, and his proof was a notarized account of his internment at Auschwitz, where he saw the camp guards usher his mother and sisters into a building he later learned was a gas chamber. The IHR refused to accept this account, claiming it wasn't sufficient proof. In response to this, Mermelstein sued them for breach of contract in the Superior Court of Los Angeles County. In the case, the judge took judicial notice of the fact that the Jews were gassed to death at Auschwitz. Basically, this means that the Holocaust was treated as irrefutable common knowledge and therefore didn't require evidence to prove gas chambers existed. This made the case pretty open and shut. The judgment was issued in 1985, in which the judge ordered the IHR to pay not only the original $50,000 from the contract, but an additional $40,000 in damages. On top of that, they were required to write a letter of apology, which was required to be addressed to Mr. Mel Mermelstein, a survivor of Auschwitz-Birkenau and Buchenwald, and all other survivors of Auschwitz. The increased negative publicity around the IHR in 1984 is probably what resulted in the firebombing of their offices and warehouses in Torrance, California. The chairman of the IHR at the time claimed that about 90% of their inventory had been destroyed in the fire. In 1993, Willis Carter would lose control of the Institute and enter a protracted legal battle with it. It was at this time that members of the IHR began to blame Cardo for their loss of inventory from the firebombing, accusing him of skimping out on fire safety for the buildings. And around the same time that Mermelstein case was being resolved, the biggest Holocaust denial case up to that point was going to trial in Canada involving Ernst Zundel. In 1983, Sabina Citron, a Polish Holocaust survivor, filed a complaint against Zundel to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in response to Samastat publishing a pamphlet called Did Six Million Really Die? The Truth at Last, written by British Holocaust denier and National Front member Richard Verall, who based his pamphlet on Hoggins' The Myth of the Six Million. The provincial government of Ontario joined Citron in bringing criminal proceedings against Zundel, being charged with spreading false information. 
The first trial charged him with knowingly spreading false information that could incite racial hatred. Zundel was found guilty by the first jury, but due to a legal technicality, the ruling was overturned on appeal. This appeal led to a second trial where he was also found guilty. At these trials, numerous Holocaust deniers were called in as witnesses, such as Robert Farrison, Dries Christofferson, and David Irving. However, the biggest name to come out of these trials, other than Zundel himself, would be Fred Leuchter. Leuchter was an American who passed himself off as an engineer. Doing this got him contracts in several states to consult them on improving their means of capital punishment, of which execution by poison gas was still legal in some states at the time. This led Zundel to hiring Leuchter to perform an investigation of the gas chambers at Auschwitz and Birkenau. In this investigation, he went to Auschwitz and illegally took samples from the gas chambers and smuggled them out of Poland. He then had the samples tested at a lab, and the tests show that the levels of chemicals used to kill Jews in the gas chambers, which were the same as those used to fumigate clothing for lice, were much lower than those used to kill lice. The results of this investigation were published by Samastat as the Leuchter Report, and it has become a very popular piece of denialist literature. Zundel presented this information found in these documents to the court, but the investigation was filled with some giant holes. The report assumed that it would take more poison to kill a human being than it would to kill an insect, However, the science proves that to be false. The chambers were filled to the brim with human bodies when being used to kill Jews. This dramatically increased the temperature in the room, which made the poisons work a lot easier. On top of that, it takes less poison to kill a human than lice, because humans haven't evolved to tolerate high levels of poison. Which is why the samples from rooms used to de-louse clothing had higher levels of poison. It also assumed that there would have been the same level of residue in the ruins after 40 years of exposure to the elements. On top of this, there were also some problems with how the samples were handled. Aside from being, of course, illegally smuggled out of Auschwitz, there was also the problem that the samples were crushed instead of being tested as they were in solid pieces. I went up to Toronto on very short notice, not knowing any of the background at all of what was going on. They wanted somebody from the laboratory to say, yes, we analyzed these samples. Yes, we produced this report on the analysis. And that's what I was there to do. I don't think the Lutcher results have any meaning. There's nothing in any of our data that says those surfaces were exposed or not. Even after I got off the stand, I didn't know where the samples came from. I didn't know which samples were which. It was only at lunch that I found out really what the case involved. Hindsight being 2020, the test was not the correct one to have been used for the analysis. He presented us with rock samples, anywhere from the size of your thumb up to half the size of your fist. We broke them up with a hammer so that we could get a subsample. Place it in a flask, add concentrated sulfuric acid. And it undergoes a reaction that produces a red colored solution. It is the intensity of this red color that we can relate with cyanide concentration. You have to look at what happens to cyanide when it reacts with a wall. Where does it go? How far does it go? Cyanide is a surface reaction. It's probably not gonna penetrate more than 10 microns. Human hair is 100 microns in diameter. Crush this sample up. I have just diluted that sample 10,000, 100,000 times. If you're gonna go look for it, you're gonna look on the surface only. There's no reason to go deep because it's not going to be there. If they had known what specific chemical Leuchter was looking for, then they wouldn't have handled the samples in the way that they did. All of these problems were brought up in the trial, along with Leuchter's lack of expertise on the issue of gas chambers. After all the evidence had been seen, a second jury found Zundel guilty. This conviction would be overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1992 when the law he was being tried for, that of spreading false information, was ruled unconstitutional. Possibly in response to the high-profile Zundel trials in Canada, countries in Europe began to pass laws explicitly banning Holocaust denial. In 1985, Germany passed its first law focused on preventing and punishing Holocaust denial, which has been modified a number of times since its passing. In 1991, the law would be used to put Otto Ernst Remmer on trial, for which he would be convicted in 1994. 
but before he could be sent to prison, he fled from Germany to Spain, who refused to extradite him due to Holocaust denial not being a crime in Spain. Remmer would die in Spain in 1997. France would pack the Gay Salt Act in 1990, which made Holocaust denial or minimization of the Holocaust a punishable crime. Robert Farrison would be tried under that law later the same year, and would be convicted guilty, and as a result, lost his job at the University of Lyon. Another high-profile case would be brought against Roger Garaudi in 1996 for his book, The Founding Myths of Israel, which posits a list of fictions used by Jews in order to establish the state of Israel in 1948. Garaudi is another one of those weird French denier biographies, so buckle up. He was born to a Catholic family in Marseille in 1913. During World War II, he joined the French Resistance, which led to him to becoming a communist after the war. He served in both the National Assembly and the Senate as a communist representative. In the early 1960s, he was a lecturer at the University of Clermont-Ferrand, but he left to go teach at Poitiers due to a feud he was having with famous leather jacket wearer Michel Foucault. In 1968, Garudi supported the liberalization reforms of the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia and was therefore opposed to the Soviet intervention which reinforced the totalitarian wing of the Communist Party there. Due in large part to these stances, Garoudi was kicked out of the Communist Party in 1970. Despite that though, Garoudi never ceased to be a Marxist. At some point after his expulsion, he converted back to Catholicism, but this would be undone in 1982 when he converted to Islam after marrying a Palestinian woman, which sent him on the path towards Holocaust denial. He would be brought to trial for his denialist writings in 1998 and found guilty. The court ordered his book to cease all further publications in France and for Garaudi to pay a fine of over 200,000 francs. The book had already been well received in the Middle East for its anti-Israel positions, but after the trial its popularity exploded, being sold in bookstores alongside Mein Kampf and the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. An English translation of The Founding Myths of Modern Israel would be published in the US by the Institute for Historical Review in the year 2000. Now these cases, although big in their time, have been overshadowed by the case that made most people, including myself, even aware of Holocaust denial as a thing, that being Irving V. Lipstadt. The first time I heard about Holocaust denial, I laughed. Having thought that through, I decided Denial was not going to be on my agenda. I had bigger things to worry about, to write about, to research, and I moved on. Fast forward a little over a decade, and two senior scholars, scholars of the Holocaust, two most prominent historians of the Holocaust, approached me and said, Deborah, let's have coffee. We have a research idea that we think is perfect for you. Intrigued and flattered that they came to me with an idea and thought me worthy of it, I asked, what is it? And they said, Holocaust denial. And for the second time, I laughed. Holocaust denial? The Flat Earth folks? The Elvis is Alive people? I should study them? And these two guys said, yeah, we're, we're intrigued. What are they about? What's their objective? How do they manage to get people to believe what they say? Deborah Lipstadt would publish Denying the Holocaust in 1993, and initially it was mostly read by Holocaust historians and those familiar with Holocaust denial. One of these people must have been David Irving because in 1994 he sent her a cease and desist letter telling her to cease publication of her book or face the consequences. In 1996 he filed a libel suit in English court. The case would be decided in April of 2000, in which the court ruled in favor of Lipstadt and Penguin. Irving would file for an appeal, based on what he claimed was new evidence that he had found. However, when the appeal trial finally happened a few years later, he didn't present the information. You see, in the first trial, Irving decided to represent himself. That ended up being a mistake. After that failure, he decided to get a lawyer to represent him in the second trial. And this lawyer, throughout this, claimed new evidence he found because he knew it would be tarnished in, well, just destroyed like it was in the first case. The appeal failed, and with that, Irving was irrevocably bankrupt, losing most of his personal files, as well as a number of original documents that would have been of value and interest to universities and researchers. And after this one, most other Holocaust denial trials never received the same attention. Ernst Sundel would eventually leave Canada and immigrate to the United States in the year 2000, but he would be deported back to Canada in 2003 because he never received legal residency status. Not only had Zundel never received legal status in the United States, 
but he had never obtained Canadian citizenship despite having lived there since the 50s and having been married to two different Canadian citizens. The only citizenship he had was with Germany, where a warrant for his arrest dating back to the 1980s for disseminating National Socialist literature was still valid. In 2005, Canada would deport Zundel back to Germany, where he would be tried and sentenced to five years in prison in 2007. He was released in 2010 due to his two years in holding after being deported to Germany being counted towards his sentence. Upon his release, the Canadian government stated that Zundel would not be allowed back into Canada. When Zundel sought a visa to enter the United States in early 2017, the Department of Homeland Security barred him on grounds that he had been convicted of a crime in a foreign country with a punishment of five or more years in prison. Zundel would die in his childhood home on August 5th, 2017. In 2001, the Institute for Historical Review sued Willis Cardo and Liberty Lobby, which resulted in a multi-million dollar claim being awarded to the IHR. This resulted in Liberty Lobby going bankrupt and shutting down all operations. The bankruptcy also meant that Liberty Lobby's publication, Spotlight, was also shut down. However, Cardo and most of the remaining staff of Spotlight would go on to form the American Free Press, which has had a similar tone to Spotlight. Cardo died in 2015 at the age of 89, and due to his receiving a Purple Heart, he was allowed to be buried in Arlington Cemetery despite protests. The Holocaust itself may have been a crime of Christian Europe, but the denial of it knows no borders. Within Western Europe and the United States, Holocaust denial is, for the most part, socially reviled. No one in the Western world who advocates Holocaust denial holds a history department faculty position at any university. There may be a small number outside of history departments who are tolerated because the subjects they teach have nothing to do with the Holocaust, but even those are few. However, outside those boundaries, Holocaust denial is taken more seriously as a legitimate school of thought. The way the Soviet Union, and subsequently modern Russia, taught about it was borderline Holocaust denial. I say borderline because they don't deny that people were rounded up and exterminated en masse, but they minimize the importance that the people being rounded up were Jews, and that the people rounding them up were Germans. The initial reports on Nazi atrocities in Eastern Europe did state that the victims were Jews, but the official records omitted that fact. The Holocaust was portrayed as a crime committed by fascists against communists rather than by German Nazis against Jews. Soviet ideological orthodoxy saw religion, nationalism, racism, and anti-Semitism as tools of capitalism to undermine communism. The nature of Jewish identity being both ethnic and religious confused the Soviets. They didn't want to acknowledge religion or ethnicity, and since Jewish identity was both, that meant they were doubly screwed. There were also political reasons for doing so. The Soviets had just conquered Eastern Europe, including part of Germany. They wanted to integrate the East Germans within the greater Soviet system. In order to do that, they needed to downplay the fact that the Germans had committed atrocities against the Soviets. So they replaced German with fascist in the narrative around the Holocaust. And a similar pattern was seen across all the Warsaw Pact countries. But while the Soviet Union was practicing a form of Holocaust minimization, outright denial was and has been welcomely embraced in the Middle East. The 19th century saw the beginnings of Jewish settlement in the Ottoman province of Palestine. This movement to immigrate to the Levant and establish a homeland for Jews is referred to as Zionism, which is a wide and diverse movement containing many variations. As more Jews began to settle in the region, we saw a change in the anti-Semitism of the Middle East. Anti-Semitism in the region didn't begin with Zionist settlements. Parts of the Quran and numerous hadiths and other Islamic writings have expressed sentiments that are recognizably anti-Semitic. However, what we see is a morphing of that anti-Semitism. Arabs had a traditionally religious anti-Semitism, similar to that of medieval Europe, in that opposition to Jews was based on a belief that your religion was right and the others was wrong. The anti-Semitism of the region began to be infused with post-enlightenment anti-Semitism that relied on conspiracy theories in place of divine edict. After the Holocaust occurred in Europe, a large number of Jews immigrated from Europe to the British Mandate Palestine. And when the Jewish and Arab partitions of Palestine were granted independence in 1948, war immediately broke out between the two and the rest of the Arab world. This story is better left for another time. But long story short, the new Jewish state called Israel beat the coalition of Arab armies and secured its existence through the force of arms. Since this point, most of the Islamic world has refused to recognize the existence of Israel and have openly anti-Semitic policies, many of them banning Jews from living in their countries at all. This began the movement to de-establish the State of Israel, referred to as anti-Zionism. 
and the Islamic world would embrace anything that aided this cause, including Holocaust denial. In the conflicts between the Arab states and Israel, it isn't uncommon for opponents of Israel to compare them to the Nazis, which is another form of borderline Holocaust denial as it minimizes the crimes of the Nazis and the suffering of their victims. Arabs are commonly portrayed as the victims in the Arab-Israeli conflict, which has created a mindset that makes denial easier to embrace. It is impossible to see the Jews as victims when you are being victimized by them, even when your suffering has no parallel to theirs. And the defenses you set up to screen out the suffering of your enemy are quite effective, it seems. We know that some form of Holocaust denial was present in the Middle East prior to the Six Day War in 1967, when Gamal Abdel Nasser, president of Egypt, expressed his doubts in an interview with an East German newspaper. No person, not even the most simple one, takes seriously the lie of the six million Jews that were murdered. Major terrorist groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas have been known to express Holocaust denial, and the trial and conviction of Roger Garaudi in 1998 bolstered denial even further. The September 11th attacks also saw an upswing in denial, which became compounded with the US invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. This also tends to be intertwined with 9-11 trutherism, with beliefs that either Jews orchestrated the attacks, or that it didn't happen but they have convinced everyone that it did. The statistics within Israel itself are quite shocking. Among Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, at least 28% say they don't believe the Holocaust happened. More surprising and concerning is that when you look at the data for just those with post-secondary education, that number jumps up to 40%. The problem is bigger when you look at Holocaust education across the region. According to the Anti-Defamation League, only about 38% of people in the region have ever heard of the Holocaust, and out of those who have heard of it, 63% believe it either didn't happen, or that the casualties have been exaggerated. Conferences and lectures dedicated to Holocaust denial have been on the decline in Europe and the United States, due in part to the internet eliminating the need to gather in one place, but also because the pseudo-academic leaders of this movement are old and dying off. The future of high-profile Holocaust deniers lies in the Middle East, and that is where big conferences dedicated to Holocaust denial are being held, and that is where the few big names in Holocaust denial are going. A Western denial organization, the Committee for Open Debate on the Holocaust, was founded by Bradley Smith, a former media director for the Institute for, of Historical Review. Founded in 1987, his organization found it difficult to make space for itself within the denial movement amongst all the other previously established groups. However, it has become the primary organization for conferences in the Middle East, such as the first international conference held in Tehran in 2006. The then president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, was known for his Holocaust denial, which is probably why the conference was invited to Tehran. They even invited the infamous anti-Zionist Orthodox rabbis to portray themselves as more legitimate than they really were. The future of Holocaust denial is going to look less old and less white. Okay, so now that we've covered this hideous idea, I'm sure you're asking, okay then, what can be done about it? Now if you're still watching the video this far, then you're probably either really interested in the subject, or you are looking for me to debunk all the Holocaust denier arguments. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but you're not going to find that here. Now it's not that I couldn't add something like that to the end of this video, but I don't really want to do that because it's been done elsewhere and quite frankly, done by people who are more intimately familiar with the primary sources than I am. There's also the fact that I have the suspicion that people who are looking for debunking Holocaust denial arguments, videos, or whatever, are looking to get into a debate with a Holocaust denier, either in person or online. And I don't recommend that, because I just don't think it's effective. The US Holocaust Memorial Museum says, Holocaust deniers want to debate the very existence of the Holocaust as a historical event. They want above all to be seen as legitimate scholars arguing a historical point. They crave attention, a public platform to air what they refer to as the other side of the issue. Because legitimate scholars do not doubt that the Holocaust happened, such assertions play no role in historical debates. Although deniers insist that the idea of the Holocaust as a myth is a reasonable topic of debate, it is clear, in light of the overwhelming weight of evidence that the Holocaust happened, that the debate the deniers put forward is more about anti-Semitism and hate politics than it is about history. You aren't going to convince a Holocaust denier that they're wrong with facts, because they didn't come to Holocaust denial through facts. So then, what do you do about it if you're not supposed to debate them? 
The first thing that should be done is to educate people on the Holocaust, but we should do so in light of what Holocaust deniers say. Now I don't mean teach students about Holocaust denial as a legitimate perspective, but when teaching about the Holocaust, bring up different positions they have and explain why they are wrong, and do so in a classroom setting rather than a debate setting. I also think that when teaching about the Holocaust, educators should use more than just the Night Trilogy or the Diary of Anne Frank. To get the full impact, you need visual evidence, pictures, and footage. It may make some people uncomfortable, but I think it's important to look evil in the face, recognize it, and call it by its name. Descriptions of concentration camps and textbooks feel distant to those reading them, especially if they aren't Jewish, but a picture or video amplifies it. An important part of this education is not to ignore the existence of Holocaust denial. Because you see, for a long time, that was the standard method of combating it. And for a time, it did work. Before the advent of the internet, most people weren't even aware of Holocaust denial as a thing. The literature about it was hard to come by, and the only way you did was either by traveling around in extremist circles, or you may have found it in a university library. In other words, the only people who had access to the literature were either those hateful enough to believe it, or educated enough to disprove it. But this came to an end with the internet, and deniers were an early adopter of the platform while professionals continued to ignore denial. This left a lot of people searching the internet for stuff about the Holocaust running into Holocaust denial with little to no writings or literature addressing the arguments made. Some Holocaust historians have tried to continue the old strategy of simply ignoring it and refusing to acknowledge its existence. These historians are stuck fighting the last war. Simply ignoring it isn't enough anymore. It has to be actively fought, but not by debating the deniers, but by confronting their ideas in an educational environment like mentioned earlier. What about banning Holocaust denial? I mean, plenty of countries in Europe do it, and the appeal of them seems pretty obvious. There are also the consequences of denial. Lack of respect for the victims of the most horrendous crimes against whole groups in the case of genocide, and for the suffering of innocent persons in the various offences listed under the heading of Crimes Against Humanity. Moreover, with that denial, would-be perpetrators will be encouraged to commit atrocities if it suits them. With denial comes silence, and if individuals, groups and states do not remember and do not resist denial, their inaction sends a signal that genocide and crimes against humanity can be committed with impunity. However, there are some consequences. When you ban a certain area of speech or thought, you turn it into a forbidden fruit. A forbidden fruit that can make a person into a subversive just by embracing it. A common counterpoint to Holocaust denial laws are that, if the truth is so obvious, why do you need to ban denial? On top of that, there's the issue of banning the denial of the Holocaust, but not other genocides. Holocaust denial is banned in much of Europe, but not Armenian genocide denial. When a Holocaust denier points this out, it becomes a validation for their belief about their Holocaust that Jews are controlling the governments and media around the world. There's also the fact that anti-denial laws turn what should be a topic of discussion and debate for historians into a legal battle where courts become the arbiters of facts. In some cases, such as that of Mel Mermelstein against the Institute of Historical Review, things went well, in which the Holocaust and the gas chambers were accepted as a common knowledge fact that didn't need evidence to support it. That case resulted in the legal recognition of the Holocaust, but up in Canada, the Zundel trial turned into a cases where the different sides were arguing about whether or not the Holocaust had happened. The same almost occurred in the cases between Deborah Lipstadt and David Irving. If Lipstadt had decided not to take the case, the UK courts would have been forced to acknowledge Irving and Holocaust deniers as legitimate historians. Luckily, she did take the case, and the court found the exact opposite. And despite the fact that a law banning Holocaust denial would have preempted Irving from filing a libel suit against her, she still opposes them. Why then do I speak in favor of this motion, namely that Holocaust denial should not be criminalized? Firstly, I favor this motion because I am a fierce defender of the right to free speech. But the limiting of ideas, including the most obnoxious hate-inspired ideas, is not an activity we should allocate to the government. Not only that, but the laws also don't have their intended effects. The idea was that the suppression of fascism was in part a matter of suppressing denial of the Holocaust. So far, those who have been prosecuted for denial have been publishers, scholars and political activists, not ordinary citizens and not skinheads. <laughs> 
So as you can see, the best way to fight Holocaust denial is not to ignore it, it's not to debate it, and it's not to ban it. What we have to do is educate. That is how you stop this terrible idea. If you're still here watching this video, I wanna thank you. This was something of a passion project for me. I've been working on it since before Christmas, a good deal before Christmas, and I wanna thank you for putting up with the long wait for it. Now, as of recording this video, I don't know this for certain, but there's a pretty good chance that this video was demonetized at the very least, and even another very good chance that it may have been age restricted. And of course, because of that, that means the reach of this video within YouTube's algorithm is probably going to be nerfed a bit. So I want to ask you guys to share this video on all your favorite social media platforms. I would really appreciate it because the algorithm is probably going to suppress its release. I would also really like to thank my patrons for helping make this video possible. Videos like this, especially if they're gonna be demonetized, cannot be made on any kind of regularity without my very generous patrons. Thanks for your patience, and I promise I won't be putting out super long videos like this very often. So thank you to my patrons for this. If you are interested in becoming a patron, then you can go to patreon.com slash casual historian, where you can get one of a number of perks depending on what level you donate at, such as getting to see videos early like the patrons for this video did, or also getting your name in the end credits of videos, as well as many other potential benefits. So go to patreon.com slash casual historian to find out more. Now, if a monthly contribution is a little too much for your blood, but you think this individual video is worth it, then you can donate to me on PayPal, which will also help me make more videos. And of course, down in the description below, there are affiliate links to different sources I use to make this video, as well as an Amazon wish list that are where I have books and other pieces of equipment that'll help me make future videos. The more money I make from making these videos, be it in the form of Patreon, ad revenue, PayPal donations, or what have you, allow me to make more and better videos. So if you want more stuff like this level of video in the future, then this is the best way to help in getting there. I would also like to thank several guests for providing some voice work for the video. Cypher the Cynical Historian, Mr. Beat, Canubis, and The Science is Layla. I would also like to give a big thanks to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for providing some of the footage used in this video. You can go to ushmm.org to learn more. It is a valuable resource for teaching about the Holocaust and Holocaust denial. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an uncomfortable amount of white supremacist material on my computer that I need to get rid of. Mm -hmm.